relates to what I said earlier on today about the Cambridge Archive of Modern Poetry, um, in the second batch of materials received by the university, Anthony Barnett's archive was included, and I came across this. More recent acquisitions to the Poetry Archive have included a very large and significant archive of the papers of Anthony Barnett. Barnett's importance as a publisher, as well as a poet, had been central to the last three decades of the 20th century. Tell that to the and, this collection, <laughs> and this collection not only brings together major aspects of the publishing firm Allardyce Barnett, which first saw both Prynne's and Crozier's collected poems into print, as well as the collected poems of Veronica Forrest Thompson, but also comprises a major collection of correspondence, which ranges from Anne-Marie Albiac to Zukowski. Barnett's considerable importance as a poet is also reflected in this archive, and the collection contains drafts of much of his work ranging from the 1970s to the present day. The collection includes letters from both Paul Oster and Jeremy Prynne, the former of which refers to blood flow, the finest and most moving work of yours I have yet read, and the latter, referring also to blood flow, says, I feel the force of its care running beneath the pallor. I think, and you heard me say this a few moments ago, that you begin to speak with tongues. <laughs> Anthony Barnett. I'd like to point out that my correspondence and meetings with Paul Auster took place at a time when he was and as obscure a poet as I still am. <laughs> um, I was rather surprised uh, when I went up to my hotel room in the Crown in Blandford that my room was described as an easy access room. And I thought, <laughs> <laughs> have I ever written accessible poetry? You know, I, I, there was a magazine many years ago called Bananas, which described me as an incomprehensible minimalist. Um, I'm glad to say that Peter Riley has written something that describes my work as the infinitely expandable minimalism. Anyway, I found out when I opened the bathroom door of the hotel room why it was an easy access room. The bathroom was equipped for... Um, uh, physically disabled people, and as a, and I thought, well, uh, as a so-called poet, I, I'm, I'm mentally disabled, but I, I'm not physically disabled. Okay, I've got the stand-up comic stuff out the way, I think. Um, David asked me to talk about translation, and um, I've changed the remit slightly. I want to talk about a Japanese poet and novelist um, who is translated, not by me, and then I'll read a, a few translations. Um, I, I often think that I never want to walk into another bookshop again the rest of my life um, because of how they are these days. But sometimes one can be surprised. And not long ago, um, I found this recently published by Picador. Um, the author's name is... Takashi Hirade, probably got the pronunciation slightly wrong, um, and this is a novel called, called The Guest Cat, which um, I found absolutely fascinating. It's, as I say, it's published by Picador in England. In America, it's published by New Directions, and I discovered that there was another New Directions uh, book by him which is not available in England, and that's called... Um, for the fighting spirit of the walnut. And then I discovered that there was an earlier translation of a work by his, um, published only in America by Tybor Dunagi Gallery, which is entitled Postcards to Donald Evans. I need to tell you about D Donald Evans, if you don't know who he is. 
he was an American um, painter who uh, died in, a, in a, an apartment fire in Amsterdam when he was 31 years old. And he spent his um, artistic career inventing 42 countries that didn't exist and painting 4,000 stamps belonging to those countries. Uh, is really quite extraordinary. Um, on the cover here, you can see um, an, a 1945 photograph of uh, Yellow Poppy. And here is a stamp that he painted uh, based on that photograph. Um, and uh, this book by Sakashi Hirada is his search for Donald Evans, and it's entitled Postcards to Donald Evans. And uh, he, he had a, um, a trip to America. He was visiting poet, uh, one, I think the I Iowa University <coughs> workshop. But, but he spent many months traveling um, the USA searching for Donald Evans, I mean searching for traces of Donald Evans, <laughs> and also in, in Amsterdam, and then in um, the, the British Isle of Lundy. Is that how you pronounce it, or is it Lundy? 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 Lundy. 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 Uh, which I'll come to later. Um, I, I find the work of the, this author quite remarkable. And um, there's also a, a sort of a personal connection, as it turned out. Um, I co-translated uh, with um, my Japanese friend, Naoko, uh, Toraiwa, um, a, a book by uh, Aktagawa. And um, her daughter, her younger daughter, is studying film at Brighton University. And she was staying with me recently. And one of these books arrived in the post. And I undid the package. And she looked at it. And she said, oh, he taught me at Tama Art <coughs> University in Japan. So uh, uh, it's kind of a circle. <coughs> and I hope that we will have something from him in a future issue of Snow. Well, I want to read you, at more or less at random, some pieces, uh, first of all, from postcards to Donald Evans. This postcard, um, May the 15th, 1987, um, Tokyo and um, also some places in Europe. In order to create a country, you have to create its mother tongue. In other words, unless a mother tongue comes into being, the country never will. So, a friend's name would be transformed into that of an imaginary country, and the friend into a representative of an imaginary mother tongue. The sound of this name, among the names of other real and imaginary countries, would come to be loaded with the infinite number of sounds of this person's mother tongue. And the first name, separated from its person, would come to make the invisible land clearly visible. On the other hand, the name of a non-existent prince sometimes turns up in an already visible land. D.E., the initials of Donald Evans, the initials, as I was told, were, because of the big coffee firm Dow Egberts, common on the streets of Holland, were they not? So that's one of the kind of imaginary postcards and traces of, uh, that he finds of Donald Evans. Um, now, at one point, Donald Evans uh, traveled to, to Britain. He wanted to visit Lundy, because Lundy issues its own postage stamps. Um, but when he arrived at uh, the, the place where the, f the boat goes to reach Lundy, uh, the weather was so bad um, he couldn't make the trip. Uh, and, and that bad weather lasted too long, so he had to leave without ever setting foot on Lundy. And the extraordinary thing is that this Japanese author made that trip to Lundy in order to follow in the footsteps of Donald Evans and, and to, to make the journey which Donald Evans himself wasn't able to make. 
And the last, the last postcard October the 19th, 1988, aboard the Oldenburg, which is the name of the boat. Dear Donald Evans, stars seem to fall without ever spoiling the entire constellation. I climbed down the steep cliff road in pitch black to the bay where the Oldenburg was moored. On my way, a cat presented itself, getting tangled up with my feet. Whenever I nearly stepped on it, the cat quickly went down a few feet ahead and then got tangled up with my feet again. You couldn't tell if the cat was hindering me or leading me. Something like a walk on the border of a dream was going on. When I finally reached the bay, the passengers taking the ferry were already waiting, whispering like shadows. The cat was gone. I took the ferry along with these strangers and then went aboard the ship that must be carrying my mail. He'd posted some cards from Lundy. As it now started to push its way through waves, more and more stars seemed to be falling. Goodbye, Donald. I just left the world, and I am bound for another. Everything is so different, dear Donald, and everything is new to me, too. So, um, this is not easy to get hold of. It's out of print. There are uh, Actually, it is easy to get hold of if you're prepared to pay a lot of money on the various online... Um, um, dealers. Uh, this seems to be one of the few low priced copies that was left. I was lucky. So that's the last, that's the first book. Uh, it's not actually the first book of Donald, uh, of, of Hirada translated to English because, yes, I need to read something else from here if I can find it. And if I can't find it, I'll just tell you what it is. Ah, here it is. December the 9th, 1985, New York City. Two days ago, I left Boston in the late afternoon and via Syracuse and Utica, arrived in New York City. In a small antique store in Cooperstown, I bought a set of worn-out black dominoes. When I started a game at the hotel, I found a few pieces were missing. Today, I visited the poet John Ashbury at West 22nd Street in the afternoon. We talked for about an hour. Subjects drifted from the ancient Japanese literary form Haibun to the Hiroshiga prints hanging on the wall to modern art criticisms. When I happened to mention your name, Donald Evans, he said he had once seen you at a party. Yes, a handsome, attractive guy. Mr. Ashbury did not speak in detail, saying, unfortunately, I don't really know his work. But afterwards, he kindly made a few phone calls and found out the address and phone number of William Katz, who was your close friend. I offered Mr. Ashbury an abridged edition of a book of my poems that had just been translated. In the complete version, the book consists of uh, 111 fragments. He told me he also had once written a book of 111 fragments. Um, <laughs> I cannot trace uh, <coughs> online um, any uh, translation of, of this book of poems by Hereda, which he apparently gave to, to Ashbury. And I suspect that it's something that was uh, published in Japan and hasn't had wide circulation. By the way, would you please tell me when I've got about five minutes left, okay? How much longer have I got at the moment? You've got five minutes left. <laughs> I asked for that. I always get what I asked for. Um, okay. Oh, I wanted to... Um, I forgot the ad. Uh, one of the reasons why I'm not talking about translation is because I, I, I published this pamphlet of a lecture I gave in Japan some years ago. It's over there. It's very cheap. It's only three pounds. In fact, it's free if you pay ten pounds to advance subscribe to the literary journal Snow issue number three. Um, right, that's got the ads out of the way. No, seriously, how much longer have I got? You have five minutes left. 
Yeah. I mean, literally about about that, you know, there about. Um, for the Fighting Spirit of the Walnut, this is a remarkable book, in my opinion. It, it, it consists of um, a number of uh, short prose paragraphs, which is very much my style of writing. Uh, I mean short paragraphs. I don't mean these are like anything I write or that I write anything like them. Um, let me read something at random. Admitting to a beautiful shadow outside itself, the creature is wounded around the chest. Its moss-grown hand still twitches in space, outstretched in an attempt to touch, fearful of losing. Nevertheless, it needs to announce, through lacking the voice with which to announce, that its breath has become a small storm, staking the downfall of this creature upon what is held dear. In the wind-world grass, blend yourself in with the soft tear of the decayed rice paper or freshly unearthed beak. Break your bones, open your skin, and strive to get the inerasable grease entangled and rippling up to finally rise from the lips toward the grass tips to bleed apart in scatters. I think there is a sense in which one might say uh, there's some surrealism, surrealistic writing in this, but I, I'd like to quote a line from a, a poem by myself which says, I have never written a surrealist poem in my life. Yeah. Okay, I, I'm going to finish since I only have another five minutes. <laughs> I'm going to read um, two pieces uh, um, from the work that I co-translated of Octagua. Octagua wrote, is most famous for writing the two stories that were eventually made in, into the film Rashomon by uh, Kurosawa. I'll just read two short pieces here. The first piece is entitled Form. It was an iron sake flask. There was a moment when this thread-patterned flask had taught him the beauty of form. Rain. He was on a big bed talking with her about this and that. Outside the bedroom window it was raining. The Ragusa rose in this rain seemed to have been rotting a while. Her face, as always, seemed to be as if in the moonlight. Yet, talking with her was not untiresome to him. Lying on his stomach, silently lighting a roll-up, he remembered it was already seven years since he had begun to live with her. Do I love this woman? he asked himself. This answer was unexpected even to himself, who had been observing himself. I still love her. And um, now I want to read um, a prose passage from one of the two books I translated of the French poet Roger Giroux. Capital. The poem is composed beyond my will. I have never wished from the start to the final state of the poem. I am from the start as if called by the painful necessity to make a poem. The countless successive states of the poem induce in me a double state of happiness and unease. Happiness of moving toward the ultimate realization that I vaguely sense of an object that will be, perhaps, and in the best cases, something else that, in drawing all its substance from me, <coughs> will have an existence of its own, with no tie to its creator other than a complicity, a kinship that unites us, the poem, and myself, with our common origin. And without the birth of the poem, I would never have become conscious of meeting this origin, of having approached it, in having heard its presence. Unease, because each state of the poem distances me from my initial purpose, which was the affirmation of my will to create something. 
distances, distances me from my creative thought, from my freedom with words and the clarity and lucidity of my thought. The prescience of the final poem rests me in each of its sentences from what I believe to be my universe, my ego in its structural relationships with the physical or psychic world. In the end, I discover I am in the presence of an alien universe, unease, that I know to be the universe I am summoned to, happiness, the sacred place I have only been able to reach, happiness, in divest divesting myself of all that constitutes me, unease. Only in losing myself do I find myself, but as soon as the poem arrives at its definite version, happiness, I feel cast out from this place I believed was reaching creating it. And this is a much greater solitude and a much greater desert to cross. Hence the growing unease and the greater and greater difficulty I have in reaching this place, knowing it will cast me further as soon as I attach myself to it. Hence my greater thirst the moment the source gushes forth on seeing it run dry, delighted, before I can bring it to my lips. And um, to finish, since I have another five minutes. You have two <laughs> minutes. <laughs> there is a loose leaf insert with my pamphlet about what I think about translation. Um, it is yet another of the hundreds of translations of one particular poem by Leopardi that's been written over the last 200 years. And until Peter Hughes produces his own Leopardi, this is the best translation in 200 <laughs> years. The Infinite. I have always loved this hill on its own, this hedgerow too although it closes off from view a great deal of the far horizon. But sitting here reflecting, unending spaces beyond all that, superhuman silences and deep concerted stillness I picture in my mind's eye until almost my heart has taken fright. And as the breeze I listen to rustles in these leaves, to such infinite silence I begin to compare this song and I summon the eternal and the dead seasons and the present and living and the sound of its voice. So in this immensity my mind goes under and my foundering at sea is sweet. Thank you. Thank you. Andrew.